Hello all, um, coming to you here from home today. Uh, I'm home with the kids and so this is a little bit more DIY than usual, but I do have uh, your gospel message for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, which is July 25th, 2021. We are planning on doing outdoor worship tomorrow. Of course, that plan may change because it's uh, raining, been raining cats and dogs today, but it's looking a little bit clearer for tomorrow. So we will uh, inform you via email and it will inform you via Facebook and on our website if we need to uh, make a change and worship indoors tomorrow morning. Um, this is the first of a five-week sermon series on the body of Christ. And so with that, I invite you to pray with me. Lord God, though we are many, you have made us one body. Give us patience to discover our gifts and appreciate our differences that we may serve your world in unity and love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our preaching text today is from Romans, the 12th chapter. Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think of yourself with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Well, I wasn't much of a joiner in high school. Never played any sports. Honor societies were a little bit out of my league. Choir and marching band weren't my thing. But what I did pour a lot of myself into was playing in rock bands. It didn't do much for my college applications, I'll tell you that right now. But thinking back, I learned a lot from it. I learned about listening, about building consensus about playing your own part and your own role in support of others. A rock band doesn't have a coach or even a team captain. Sometimes, you know, you have somebody who gathers everybody together, but there's no formal leadership structure. There's no structure of rehearsals or performances and gigs that's handed down from on high like with other school clubs you get together because you're all passionate about the same thing the music itself and you decide together what kind of music you're going to do and how you're going to write it or learn it or figure it figure it out and where and when you're going to play it together each person has a skill that doesn't work by itself. I learned as a high school freshman, no matter how big your ego is, it can't play guitar and rhythm guitar and drums and bass for you. No matter how high you turn up your amp, it's no comparison to the quality of noise that you can unleash on the neighborhood when you get a few of your friends together. You have to be part of something more in order to make it work. 
you have to each add your individual gifts and become one thing together. More than the sum of your parts. One body. One of those lessons stuck with me as I was prepping this sermon today on the body of Christ. When Paul writes to the Romans that the church is one body in Christ. Believe it or not, the one body part isn't exactly new. In fact, the ancient Greek philosophers used to write about the city, the people of a village, as one body, and each person is a different body part. What's new for Paul is the in Christ part. That's the revolutionary part of this. This is a new kind of body. Because a village is a body because it has to be for survival. People have to specialize and help each other for survival. But this body of Christ is not held together by ethnicity, by family lineage, by physical closeness. None of those things. No, this body is People different from ethnicities and different social classes with different gifts, each held together simply by their faith in Christ, by the difference that Jesus has made in their lives. They have every reason to be separate, and yet Christ and the Holy Spirit has called them together. This is a body, body gathered not by human interests, but by the Holy Spirit. Still, that diversity is both a blessing and a challenge. See, when the drummer counts off, you as a band have to figure out together where you're, whether you're going to be playing Metallica or Nirvana. Sometimes that's a sticking point, right? Figuring out what kind of body this body is going to be. This body of Christ in Rome is made up of both Jews and Gentiles at a time when those two groups do not mix. Rome in particular has had a hard time in their Christian community because the Jesus movement, as with many other places, began among the Jews in their synagogues. But when the Jews were exiled from the city of Rome by the emperor Claudius, Gentile believers had to take over in leadership. And then when Jewish believers have returned now, things are a little awkward, to say the least. A diverse body of believers who have been torn apart for a long time and spent a long time apart and then gathers again and it's awkward. Can you imagine? That doesn't sound familiar at all, right? A group that has been separate for long than they're, longer than they're comfortable with and then finally gathering together and trying to figure out how to do it all again and maybe do it all differently? That rings pretty true for us, right? We too are the body of Christ. We too have struggled with how to be Christ's body under duress in pandemic times with physically being apart from one another. And before you tell me that it's impossible for the body of Christ to be the body of Christ unless we're physically together, let me remind you that the majority of the New Testament, including the reading that we are reflecting on today, consists of letters written by Christian leaders from long distances, hundreds of miles away, to fellow believers. So I will grant that it's not easy to be the body of Christ when we're physically separate, but you better believe that it's possible. It's been done before. That's how our church began. The question is, when the time comes, how does God get the band back together, so to speak? We are one body. We need each other. But how does God hold this body together? The short answer, God gives each of us gifts that only work as part of the body. A drum solo or a guitar solo is great for a little bit, but they work better if the drums and the guitars and the bass and the keyboards and the whatever else is all part of a band in sync together. We need each other. So we need to talk 
about spiritual gifts. Some Christian denominations focus on them a lot more. They're laser focused on spiritual gifts. We've probably heard of charismatic Christians, and I'll talk a little bit about that word charisma uh, later on. But all Christians have spiritual gifts. I want to repeat that. We may not always realize it, but every single Christian has spiritual gifts. The first thing that we should know about spiritual gifts is that in the Greek language, and I'm sorry I'm going to go a little heavy on the Greek with a couple of different words today. In the Greek language, the word for grace, as in God's grace, as in we are saved by grace, and the word for gift, is the exact same word, this Greek word charism. The very same God who saves us by grace, the same God who offers us healing and a right relationship and eternal life for free, also offers us spiritual gifts for free, offers us the ability to be the body of Christ in unique ways for unique individuals for free. With the free gift of salvation comes the free gift of service. And man, we are really not used to thinking of service and the ability to serve as a gift. But it is. Taking our spiritual gifts down off the shelf to actually use them can change our lives. I know it's weird. But serving in the right time and place, using our spiritual gifts, doesn't take energy away from us. It actually gives us energy if we are doing what our gifts, our spiritual gifts, uh, match up with. I know it's weird, but serving in the right time and place doesn't take that energy away. It gives it to us. Serving others fills us up. The seven spiritual gifts that Paul lists fall into two different categories. The first category has to do with gifts of speaking, prophecy, teaching, and exhorting, or you might call it encouraging. People with these gifts use their words to strengthen hearts and minds. Prophets don't just tell the future, they have a knack for seeing the present situation from God's perspective and for telling the truth of what they see. Teachers who have a spiritual gift don't just rehash and regurgitate old traditions and force students to memorize material. They take the stories of our faith and reinterpret them for today's listeners and help people understand how they are relevant to our lives today. Exhorters or encouragers. Now this might be one of my favorites because this people have no idea. This world has no idea how valuable of a spiritual gift that is. You will never see professional encourager on the job description. But each of us probably has a story, probably a recent story, if you really think about it and rack your brain. You probably have a recent story of being near the end of your rope of feeling isolated, of wondering how in the world we are going to go on another day like this. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, you get a card, a call, a text, an email, maybe even a personal visit from an encourager, from an exhorter, from somebody who just does this because that's who they are. That's what they do. And that is a spiritual gift. Sometimes Lutherans get intimidated by this spiritual gift language because we assume that it's all about this supernatural stuff like speaking in tongues or like healing and all these kind of things that, we, you know, we assume that it's all based on this supernatural stuff that we're not sure that we can put our faith in. We're not sure that we can believe it. But sure enough, each of us has experienced what it's like to be in the presence of somebody with spiritual gifts and to use spiritual gifts, whether we realize it or not. The second category Paul goes into with spiritual gifts is spiritual gifts of serving 
others, especially the disadvantaged in the community. So here you have ministry, which we would also call service. You have giving or sharing. We have leadership or caregiving. And finally, you have compassion or acts of mercy. You can probably tell from all my extra definitions that these are tough to translate properly. So ministry, the Greek word for this is diakonia, which is where we get the word deacon. Now, the ELCA actually does have deacon as a professional role. These are folks who go to seminary and study specifically to become what they call a minister of word and service. And so these are people who usually want to put their faith in action and train others to put their faith in action beyond the congregation's walls and serve their neighbors in concrete ways out in the world, word and service. Now, giving is another great gift because it's another one that you won't see on a resume, and yet it makes the world go round. Giving and sharing, not just of what we have, but of who we are, makes the world go round. And there are some folks who would do it, who could never stop doing it even if they tried. And that's the folks who actually have... Everybody should give and be generous, right? But there are folks who couldn't stop doing it if they tried, and those are the folks who have that spiritual gift of giving and sharing. And, and then you got leadership, which I think is an interesting thing because the, uh, the, the word there could also translate just simply as caregiving. And I think for Paul, that's what a leader is. A leader is not somebody who just likes to tell others what to do. A leader is somebody who wants to make sure that everybody in the group has what they need. A real leader doesn't need to do a screeching guitar solo on every song. A real leader is the one who's gathering cash together behind the scenes so they can order a pizza after practice. Compassion. Now that's an interesting one. Because it looks very different depending on who you're looking at. These are folks who can't rest while others are struggling. So whether that means helping somebody, befriending them, fighting for them, that may differ depending on who you're talking about. But these are folks who do acts of mercy, not because they feel obligated, but they again, because they couldn't stop if they tried. It is their spiritual gift. So this is just a very quick intro into the spiritual gifts. There's lots, lots more to say. There's a weeks and weeks long course, and I'd love to run it again. It's been about two years, so it's time we did it again. But the thought that gnawed on me as I was reading this text and reflecting on the body of Christ, and especially during this long period of time that the body of Christ among us was not able to physically gather because of COVID, the thought was this. I have heard so many people say that they miss worship, and I do too. I've heard people say they missed singing. We missed communion. We missed being inside the building. We missed fellowship and conversation. And slowly those things have been able to reemerge as the scene gets safer. And I missed all those things too. But you know what? In all this time, I haven't heard one person say, I miss using my spiritual gifts. I miss building up the body of Christ. I miss serving one another and serving Christ's world. And I can think of two possible reasons for this. One is, we don't know what our gifts are, much less how to use them. And sadly, I think that may be part of it. But I think the other part of it is that not being physically together has not necessarily stopped us from being the body of Christ and doing what the body of Christ does. Go back to the first verse of this lesson where Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore... That's the exact same Greek word as that exhortation piece. So from hundreds of miles away, Paul is using his spiritual gift and being an exhorter, an encourager, because that's who he is seven days a week, whether he's in Rome with these other believers that he's introducing himself to, or whether he's hundreds of miles away, he can still be an encourager, whether he is physically in worship with them or not. So yes, 
I think one essential thing that God wants us to do to gather ourselves together again is to teach us more about our gifts and our purpose and how to use those gifts toward that purpose. For sure, I think that's something we need. But as we learn, I think we're going to find out something remarkable, and that is that we have been using these gifts all along. The body of Christ doesn't stop being the body of Christ when we are physically apart. Caregivers don't stop caring. Givers don't stop giving. Teachers don't stop teaching when the times get tough. And boy, haven't we seen some of that, right? It may look a lot different, but the spiritual gift that we find, that, I'm sorry, but the spiritual gift that we have when it when we really have a spiritual gift, we find ways to do it. Because it's part of who we are. It can't be left on the shelf for very long. So there's a reason all those years ago that it wasn't enough for my friends and me to just sit and listen to music together. That we There's a reason why with minimal parental, parental involvement, we just felt this need that we had to be part of the music. So yeah, maybe we had some dream in the back of our minds of playing sold-out stadiums, but for me it was different. I think it was just more of how good it felt to be part of something I believed in, something larger than myself, where every person voluntarily contributes an essential part of what it is. That's what the body of Christ is all about. And if we could do that with a bunch of dusty old amps and secondhand instruments, just imagine what God can do with the body of Christ that truly knows who we are, knows how God has gifted us, knows how God has made us, and why God has gathered us together. I can't wait to find out once again. Amen.